Cognitive science is all about the mind. But we're not the only ones with minds. Animals have them too. That's why I decided to make a video about dinosaurs. Our perception of dinosaurs has changed a lot over time. Dinosaurs get a bad rap. The word dinosaur means terrible lizard in Greek. For over a century after their discovery, dinosaurs were consistently depicted as dumb, plodding, cold-blooded monsters. Bigger and more terrifying than anything that walks on land today, but small-brained, acting on primitive instincts in a harsh and primitive world. This changed in the 1970s. We began to view dinosaurs as active, dynamic, and even intelligent. New discoveries suggested that many dinosaurs were warm-blooded and had feathers. They were dedicated parents, they lived and traveled in groups, and many may have been capable of communication. They're moving in herds. It was a dinosaur renaissance. Depictions of dinosaurs in fiction shifted from lumbering brutes to highly intelligent, even cunning animals. We are being hunted. Smart enough to understand and deceive human beings. Clever girl. And even open doors. This might seem like a weird topic for a channel dedicated to cognitive science and language, but cognitive science is the study of minds, wherever we find them. I study human cognition, but I'm really fascinated by animal cognition too. I find birds especially intriguing. They've developed into some of the planet's most intelligent organisms. They're able to reason, use tools, and even have highly structured forms of vocal communication, just like us. And of course, they're the living descendants of the dinosaurs that lived 65 million years ago. The question is, how do we get from there to here? New discoveries are revealing previously unknown dinosaur behaviors and shedding light on a feature of dinosaur anatomy that has been debated for over 150 years, the brain. What does all of this tell us about the inner cognitive life of these extinct animals? How smart were the dinosaurs? I'm Ryan, and this is Language of Mind. In 1869, a fossil collector named James Whitaker Hulk unearthed a portion of a fossilized skull on the Isle of Wight. It was a fossil of the leaf-eating dinosaur Iguanodon, and it was special. It was the first dinosaur fossil ever found that preserved the brain case. From this, paleontologists could speculate about the size and shape of Iguanodon's brain. This was the beginning of paleoneurology, the study of dinosaur brains and dinosaur cognition. Early fossil collectors were really interested in dinosaur brains, but they noticed something strange. Dinosaurs were massive, but their brains didn't seem to match. Othniel Marsh, one of the most prominent paleontologists of the 19th century, described dinosaurs as having brain cavities vastly smaller than any existing reptile. Early paleontology painted a picture of dinosaurs as almost too dumb to function. Dopey, lumbering behemoths doomed to extinction by their own stupidity. Early paleontologists used fossils to estimate dinosaur brain size, then compared estimated brain mass to estimated body size. This brain-body ratio can serve as a rough way to estimate and compare intelligence of different animals. But it's not a perfect measure. Human brains are about 2% of our total mass, but at least one species of ant has a brain that's 15% of its total body weight. The size of an animal's brain doesn't necessarily tell you how intelligent it is. As a general rule, the bigger the animal, the bigger the brain. There's a certain amount of brain required for most animals to simply function, to operate their bodies and their sensory organs. And as animals get bigger, they need more and more brain for these processes. But bodies tend to scale up much faster than brains do. Sometimes very intelligent animals like whales wind up with a low brain-body ratio just because of their massive size. Dinosaurs might also suffer from this problem, since many of them are among the largest animals to ever walk the Earth. An early estimate of the brain-body ratio of Brachiosaurus was 1 to 200,000, meaning its body was 200,000 times as massive as its brain. Does that mean it had a tiny brain? Not necessarily. It just means that it had a truly gargantuan body. One century after James Hulk's discovery, a new method was developed to estimate and compare the brains and intelligence of animals of radically different body sizes and from different geological time periods. It's called the Encephalization Quotient, or EQ. EQ provides a more accurate estimate of an animal's cognitive ability by comparing it to a large sample of existing animals. The encephalization quotient essentially normalizes the brain-body ratio, so an animal with a ratio in line with similar animals will have an EQ of 1. Humans and mice, for example, have the same brain-body ratio. In both cases, the brain is about 2% of total body weight. But human EQ ranges between 7 and 8, while a mouse only has an EQ of 0.5. 
That means a human's brain is more than seven times larger than a typical mammal our size, and the mouse's brain is only half as big as expected. Let's estimate the EQ of some dinosaurs. Sauropods like Diplodocus have been estimated to have the lowest EQ of the dinosaurs at 0.4. Given their massive body size, it's predicted they would have the smallest brain-body ratio, but even if we adjust for body size, their EQ is still below modern reptiles. This seems to fit with their slow and passive lifestyle, relying on their size to avoid being attacked by predators. Ankylosaurs aren't much better, with an EQ around 0.5. Stegosaurus has a reputation for one of the smallest brains among the dinosaurs. Its brain is said to be smaller than a walnut and a body larger than an elephant. But it's middle of the pack for large herbivores at 0.6. And Triceratops comes in at 0.7. So far all of these are below 1, meaning smaller than expected for animals of this size. But not all dinosaurs fail to measure up. Duck-billed hadrosaurs and their relatives score pretty high, around 2.8, even though they're herbivores. T-Rex has a similar EQ of 2.7. And the Manoraptor and Theropods, that's right, raptors, had the highest EQs of all, many of them above four. That means their brains were four times larger than expected for dinosaurs of their size. How much should we trust these numbers? Personally, I'm skeptical. The estimates for brain and body sizes can be really variable for dinosaurs, and the EQ estimates change a lot if we assume dinosaur brains should scale more like reptile brains or more like bird brains. Some of these values are so high, they're greater than some of the smartest mammals and birds alive today. Chimps and ravens, for example, both have an EQ around 2.5. The best way to estimate intelligence might not be to measure the size of the brain, but to count the number of neurons in the brain. This turns out to correlate very strongly with complex cognition and intelligent behavior in living animals. In particular, the number of neurons in the cerebrum seems to be very predictive of overall cognitive ability. This is Dr. Susanna Herculano Huzel. She studies brains using a method called isotropic fractionation, essentially turning brains into soup to get highly accurate neuron counts. Using this method, she discovered that we have about 16 billion neurons in our cerebrum. For reference, a chihuahua has about 500 million, a raven has about a billion, a chimpanzee is around 7.7 .7 billion, and a killer whale has over 40 billion neurons. We've tried to estimate neurons in dinosaur brains before, but those estimates were based on bad assumptions. Dr. Herculano Huzel's method gives us a much better picture of the brain power of dinosaurs than brain mass or EQ. How do dinosaurs stack up? Something to keep in mind before we start is that these numbers can vary a lot based on whether the dinosaur was warm-blooded or cold-blooded. This is still a topic of debate for most dinosaurs, but we have good reason to believe that many dinosaurs were warm-blooded based on factors like lifestyle and growth rates. Got it? Let's count some neurons. Diplodocus may have only had an EQ of 0.4, but Assuming it was warm-blooded, it's estimated to have up to 850 million neurons, the same as an African gray parrot or a beagle. What about the unfortunately small-brained Stegosaurus? Assuming Stegosaurus was cold-blooded, as argued in a recent study, Stegosaurus would only have about 84 million neurons, about the same as a gray squirrel. Iguanodon, our original poster child for dinosaur brains, may have had 1.5 billion neurons, about the same as a squirrel monkey. But the theropods are the real standouts, with neuron counts that rival modern primates. Allosaurus clocks in around 1.9 billion neurons, the same as a macaw or a rhesus monkey. And T-Rex, the king of predators, may have had as many as 2 to 3 billion neurons. That's as many neurons as the most intelligent birds currently alive. So imagine life in the late Cretaceous, a landscape dominated by a predator that weighs twice as much as an elephant with as many neurons as a baboon. It had 13 times the visual acuity of a human, could run up to 20 miles an hour, and might have lived for 50 years. And yes, it could see you even if you didn't move. These numbers are impressive, but they're still estimates based on scans of fossil skulls. There are a lot of variables that can dramatically change the estimates, such as how a dinosaur's brain filled its brain case, and whether the species was cold or warm-blooded. There's still some debate about dinosaur metabolism for at least some of these species, so these numbers should be taken with a grain of salt. And brains are only one side of the story. What I really want to know is about cognition. Being intelligent means being able to perform complex tasks. Things like reasoning, communicating, and problem solving. But how can you observe dinosaur behavior? I mean, they're extinct, right? Not exactly. We can compare extinct dinosaurs to birds. And that's because birds are dinosaurs. They're not just descended from dinosaurs. Birds are the last remaining members of the dinosaur family. They literally are dinosaurs. We can also compare dinosaurs to living crocodilians, crocodiles, alligators, caimans, and gharials. 
While birds are descended from dinosaurs, crocodiles share a common ancestor with dinosaurs. These two groups, dinosaurs, including birds, and crocodilians, form a clade called Archosauria. And so we can trace intelligent behavior back through time by observing the behaviors of birds and crocodiles to see what they have in common and what they don't. One thing that birds and crocodiles share is parental care. Birds and crocodiles can both be pretty invested as parents, feeding and protecting their offspring after they hatch. Parental care is a hallmark of intelligent animals. In fact, as a general rule, the more intelligent an animal is, the more parental investment is typically required for their offspring to reach maturity. Intelligent animals like birds or mammals tend to be born helpless and take longer to develop than less intelligent animals like reptiles or sharks. Parental care is widespread in the archosaur clade, which suggests that it was also prevalent among extinct dinosaurs. When Oviraptor was discovered, it was found on top of a clutch of eggs. Oviraptor's discoverer, Henry Osborne, interpreted this as a hungry predator killed suddenly in the act of stealing eggs from a protoceratops nest. This egg-stealing reputation stuck with Oviraptor for decades. Even its name means egg thief, until paleontologists re-examined the evidence and found that Oviraptor wasn't stealing eggs, it was brooding. Oviraptor wasn't a savage. It was a parent so dedicated to its young that it stayed with its eggs even as it died. But this behavior wasn't unusual. It was widespread in the dinosaur world. One of the best known examples of dinosaur parenting comes from the duck-billed hadrosaur, Myasaura. Myasaura was discovered with nests filled with eggs and young hatchlings. Myasaura is so strongly associated with parental care, its name literally means good mother reptile. And it wasn't only females that were invested in their young. Dinosaur dads were very involved in child care too. Maternal care dominates among crocodilians, but paternal care is widespread among modern birds. In many bird species, males and females will share the responsibility of incubating eggs and feeding hatchlings. In some species, like the more primitive paleognaths, the father is the primary caregiver. This paternal care behavior may have had a dinosaur origin. Adult male dinosaurs have been found at fossilized nest sites in a way that seems to parallel paternal care behavior in modern birds. Oviraptor in particular may have been a dedicated father. A behavior that goes hand in hand with parenting is vocalization. Babies are helpless, so they need a way to get their parents' attention. Across Archosauria, we see the development of infant vocalization to reinforce parental investment. Modern crocodiles are very selective. They only respond to the highest pitched juvenile calls. Why? Don't they love all of their children equally? There's a good reason for crocodiles to play favorites. Smaller, younger juveniles produce very high-pitched calls. Larger, older juveniles produce lower-pitched calls. And the larger and older the offspring, the less likely that it needs protection or food from its parent. On the other side of the archosaur family, birds are among the most sophisticated vocal learners in the animal kingdom, surpassed only by humans. Unfortunately, vocal anatomy almost never gets fossilized, but there is one part of the anatomy that does preserve, the cochlea of the inner ear. The shape and size of the cochlea of archosaurus has changed over time, and these changes affect both their hearing range and their vestibular system, the system that governs internal sense of balance and orientation in space. The changing shape of the inner ear may have enabled vocal learning, parental care, bipedalism, and even flight. Quadrupedal reptiles have a relatively short cochlea, and they also don't display any parental care behavior or juvenile vocalization. In archosaurs, like crocodilians, the inner ear lengthens, which expands their range of hearing for high-pitched juvenile calls. It's the origin of parental care! In dinosaurs, we see the beginning of bird-like cochlea, and this seems to correspond to bipedalism, early flight, and changes in vocalization. Communication shifts from juveniles crying out for their parents' attention, to adults vocalizing with each other, like we see in modern birds. Although dinosaurs didn't have the type of syrinx that birds use to produce complex vocalizations, a fossilized larynx from the ankylosaur Panacosaurus suggests that it may have been able to use its larynx to control airflow and produce bird-like vocalizations. Panacosaurus could chirp, and it most likely used its vocalizations in courtship, parental care, predator defense, and territorial calls just like modern crocodiles and birds. The greatest dinosaur communicators may have been the duck-billed hadrosaurs. Like other dinosaurs, they had an elongated cochlea, in their case, optimized for sounds between 80 and 500 hertz. The reason for this optimization can be found in another part of their anatomy, their crests. Hadrosaur crests were big and beautiful, serving to show off to other hadrosaurs the way a peacock shows off its tail feathers, or an elk displays its antlers. 
but they almost certainly had another function. What you're hearing is a reconstruction of a possible hadrosaur vocalization. Using data from scans of fossilized crests, researchers have been able to recreate the way hadrosaur crests amplified sound to produce haunting low-pitched calls. Scans of Parasaurolophus crests show that the resonant frequency ranged from 50 to 375 hertz, overlapping almost perfectly with their estimated hearing range of 80 to 500 hertz. Hadrosaurs also had relatively large brains compared to other dinosaurs, and a large cerebrum in particular, taking up 45% of total brain volume, higher than T-Rex, and on par with raptors and avian dinosaurs like Archaeopteryx. This makes sense when we consider their high parental involvement, their social lifestyle, and the possibility of complex adult communication. The hadrosaurs were most likely the smartest and most cognitively complex of all the herbivorous non-theropod dinosaurs. So we have evidence that dinosaurs were highly engaged parents and that they co-opted juvenile vocalization for more complex communication. This is pretty good circumstantial evidence of some advanced behavior. But I want to dig deeper into the behavior of modern birds and crocodilians to see if we can reconstruct dinosaur cognition. I want to see if dinosaurs could reason. Another cognitive skill that birds and primates excel at is a kind of negative inference called reasoning by exclusion. It works like this. Here I have two bowls and I'm going to put a piece of food in each one. The bowl on the right, I'm going to put a date. The bowl on the left, I'll put a sweet pepper. Now I'm going to hide both of the bowls behind this screen, and I'm going to eat one of the foods. If you've been paying attention, you know that this bowl is empty. I never showed you that it was empty, but you can figure it out using a very simple process of elimination. So if you're smart, you'll pick the pepper. This is a pretty basic skill for humans, but not every animal has mastered this task. Most, but not all primates can do it. Chimps are masters, but lemurs lack the skill altogether. And it's not just primates. Dogs, goats, sheep, pigs, and a variety of birds can do it too. That's right, birds. African gray parrots and crows are just as good at reasoning by exclusion as chimpanzees. In fact, crows even have another ability called retrospective metacognition. Metacognition is the ability to think and reflect on your own cognition, to introspect about your own internal thought processes. In reasoning by exclusion tasks, crows can actually assess whether they are likely to get the answer right or wrong after they've seen the switch take place, and they will strategically quit if they can get a consolation prize. These crows are thinking about their ability to reason accurately and they're optimizing their strategy to get the most food. This is seriously advanced cognition. Modern birds can introspect about their own internal thought processes, but they can also be aware of the internal thoughts and moods of other birds. Scrub jays are like squirrels. They routinely hide food and store it for later. This takes a lot of brain power because they don't just keep track of their own hiding places. They remember where other jays have hidden their food too. Why would they bother committing all this to memory? Crime. Scrub jays are notorious thieves. Stealing food from another jay's hiding place is an easy way to get extra food if they have the opportunity. Living in a world of thieves is tricky. Jays will often rehide their food if they notice another jay is watching them, but only if they have previously stolen from another jay themselves. The innocents don't have this paranoia. They don't rehide their food even if another bird is watching. Why this difference? Jays with stealing experience understand the possibility of theft all too well because they themselves have done it. And because they have the personal experience of having stolen, they can imagine another bird wanting to do the same. It demonstrates an understanding of the possible intentions of others, using your own intentions and behavior as a model. This skill is called theory of mind, and it's something that humans don't master until we're about four years old. There's an even better example of theory of mind in birds. Eurasian jays have an interesting courtship behavior. Males will feed their female partners as part of the courtship ritual, not unlike going on a date and buying someone dinner. In experiments, male jays have been shown to anticipate what kind of food their partner will want, inferring the desires and preferences of their mate. In these experiments, researchers will offer the male jay two kinds of food that their mate loves. But there's a catch. The researchers have already fed one of the foods to the female, meaning she'll be tired of it and she'll prefer the other food. Here's where it gets interesting. If the male sees this happen and knows what kind of food his partner has already been fed, 
he'll offer her the other choice. If it happens in secret, he'll choose at random. How does he know what to pick? He must be thinking about his partner's mood and maybe projecting how he would feel in her situation. He's thinking about what she's thinking. The ability to infer the desires of another is evidence of a theory of mind and might even be evidence of empathy. These are exceptional examples and we can't be sure that dinosaurs had abilities this sophisticated. But there is one cognitive ability that we can be reasonably sure was present in extinct dinosaurs by comparing behavior of living birds and crocodilians. And it's related to theory of mind. It's a common trait shared by humans and other primates called gaze following. If I notice someone looking off into the distance, I'm probably going to look too. I want to know what they're looking at. This is a very low level type of gaze following and it's an ability we share with all amniotes. That includes all mammals, birds, and reptiles. It's a really primitive cognitive trait, but there's a higher level version of this called geometric gaze following. If I notice someone looking at something but there's an object blocking my view, I might reposition myself to find out what they're looking at. This is a kind of visual perspective taking, imagining what another person is experiencing and then repositioning myself so I can experience it too. It requires an awareness of the other person's point of view, that they're looking at something in particular that I can't see. This more complex kind of gaze following has been observed in primates, wolves, crows, starlings, and according to a recent study, a more primitive group of birds called paleognates. The study tested a swath of archosaurs including emus, rheas, elegant crested tinamous, red jungle fowl, and American alligators in simple and complex gaze following tasks. What the study found was that all archosaurs, birds and alligators, could perform simple gaze following, tracking another animal's gaze into the distance. But only the birds could perform the more complex geometric gaze following, including the paleognaths, the emus, rheas, and tinamous. This is noteworthy because the paleognaths have more primitive dinosaur-like brains than more cognitively complex birds like crows and parrots. But even these primitive birds have this ability, one that crocodilians lack which suggests that geometric gaze following must have originated among the dinosaurs. The paleognath birds also displayed a checking back behavior, looking back to the other bird when the gaze and the target don't quite match in order to reassess. This is an especially impressive behavior because it shows that they're aware that the other bird is looking at something. It's an understanding about the mental state and intention of someone else. This ability may also be the precursor for a more advanced theory of mind like we see in humans and modern birds and it almost surely is an ability that was shared by at least some extinct dinosaurs. It's unlikely that extinct dinosaurs had reasoning abilities as intricate as we see in modern birds, but the cognitive abilities of birds may have had their origins in similar but more rudimentary cognitive abilities of their dinosaur ancestors. Remember that theropod dinosaurs, the ancestors of modern birds, may have had as many neurons as modern baboons, macaques, or parrots. I think it's extremely plausible that some form of these abilities was present at least in the Cretaceous. So how smart were the dinosaurs? Well, they're a diverse group, so it's a mixed bag. But the old view of dinosaurs is dead. They're not slow, stupid lizards. They're incredibly dynamic, and in some cases, frighteningly intelligent. They cared for their young, engaged in elaborate courtship displays, may have been capable of vocal communication and abstract reasoning, and may have even had a primitive theory of mind. If Dr. Herculano Huzel is right, Tyrannosaurus rex may have had more neurons than modern birds capable of making and using tools. T-Rex and its theropod relatives like Deinonychus and Velociraptor may have had the brain power necessary to make tools, solve complex problems, and even develop culture, just like some birds and primates do today. Hey everybody, thanks for sticking with me. I know this might seem like a weird topic for a cognitive science channel, but I'm super into dinosaurs, and all kinds of cognition fall under the umbrella of CogSci, so I feel like it's fair game. What's your favorite dinosaur? Leave me a comment and tell me why it's your favorite. If you tell me yours, I might tell you mine. And let me know if there's a topic you'd like me to cover. Are you interested in other kinds of animal cognition? Should I stick to talking about language? Let me know. 